see you. Jerry uh, is a teacher in musicology at Ryerson University for about 20, 25 years now. He's had an interest in the sort of the Japanese side of the music, and so he's offered to come and present to us uh, part of his his interest and his selecting. So, without further ado, carry on, Jerry. Thanks a lot. Oh, by the way, Jerry's a new member. Oh. And he's up here already <laughs> doing a presentation. And probably the next thing they're going to get him to do is write an article for the APN. <laughs> so, so please, you know, join the club. Help us out. Thanks, Jerry. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, I, I wanted to start before uh, getting into things just to say um, uh, thanks for giving me a chance to, to do this because um, this is something I've, I've thought about for quite a while. Um, maybe 25 years ago when I was living in Japan, um, uh, I was there for about 14 years and at some point, uh, well after a couple of years I started studying traditional music and then after a few more years um, I found some 78 records at a flea market and um, it kind of opened things up for me because at that point in, in uh, the music that I was studying, you could find it on CDs or you could hear it on the on certain radio programs. It, it was a sort of a semi-classical music at that point, and uh, it all sounded the same. And when I was finding these old records, I'd find versions of, of, of songs that sounded uh, completely different. I knew they were the song, but it was just a different arrangement, a different feeling. Um, it was still a kind of living music at that point. So. Finding these records uh, did that for, for me first off. And, uh, you know, it it um, opened up the music for me. It made, made me realize that not too long ago it was a, a still a living um, tradition. Um, and then I got interested in, in other um, uh, types of music and found records. And I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't call myself a collector uh, in this place because you, you guys are real collectors. But I, you know, I, 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 I figured out some things by uh, amassing these records and figuring out uh, the serial numbers and, and the different companies that exist. And so <clears throat> initially that's what I thought I would do with this talk. Um, I, I, for a little while I've been thinking about doing it maybe at, um, you know, at the Japan Foundation or something and, and uh, uh, talking about finding the records and, and uh, you know, my favorite records and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, but I, I, when I started to put the talk together for uh, for this group, I, I, it seemed to kind of shift focus and I started to think about the things that you might be more interested in. So that's kind of where I've um, shifted off to. But um, um, yeah, so what I was going to say for this talk, uh, I'm an academic so I, I have this thing about uh, talking about sources. Um, so there's a specific book um, in Japanese uh, about Japanese record history by a guy named Kurata. And so uh, that's one of the main sources that I had to rely on. And now with the internet, there's a, webs a website uh, about 78 records in Japan that's quite extensive. Um, I don't know that it's uh, entirely academic, but um, there's uh, whoever's running it is, seems to know their stuff. There's, they, they, they post uh, serial numbers and uh, photographs of labels, and um, I picked up a lot about maybe when the records that I have were recorded from that. Uh, they've been, it's been kind of a mystery to me for these 25 years. Um, but, uh, and I guess I have some questions to it, maybe at the end of things for, for everybody here, but uh, what I found was even with that, all the serial numbers that that website and many, many pages that it has on it, uh, the serial numbers of my records still seem to be outside of those numbers very often, more, maybe more than half the time. There's still lots of records that I have that just don't fit with the, with the, you know, the knowledge that's out there or something. I, I don't know if it's the same. It seems to me that it, that shouldn't be the case because Japanese are very kind of meticulous about this sort of thing. But uh, the the one book that still right now is is used for for uh, you know talking about the history of phonographs in Japan doesn't have anything about serial numbers and this website is is kind of incomplete so. It's, um, it's still an area that I don't know a lot about. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm presenting today that's still <coughs> uh, 
just me guessing at things or, or just presenting the, the very little that I know about it. So that's where we're, we're starting from. Um, so I, I've broken it down into uh, a few different topics. Um, just the, the very, uh, the history just before recording happens in Japan. I, I, I have a few slides about that to get us to that point. And then I talk about um, the first recordings and they're by uh, Westerners, actually by an American who has come up here before, Fred Frederick Geisberg. I think there was a book on sale a little while ago with him. Um, and so we talk a little bit about those early recording sessions. And then uh, I, I look a bit at record companies, again, just from <clears throat> my own collection and a little bit of what I saw online to try to figure out something about, about, about that. So it's not, a, it's not a thorough history by any stretch, but it's what I figured out so far. And then the next topic is even worse, record players. You know, the equipment is not my specialty at all. So I've just posted a very few slides uh, saying this is, <laughs> this is the very little that I know about it. And, and at that point, with, with that equipment, um, uh, I might open things up to you guys to, 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 to you know, uh, tell me how it jives with, uh, you know, with North American um, developments. Because uh, it, it's, what we'll see pretty soon is that the Japanese aren't far behind uh, at any given point in, in taking in the new um, technology. So, so it probably mirrors it in terms of time and equipment uh, pretty closely. Um, and the last thing is really the, the, the thing I do know about, and um, I've really limited myself here, uh, it's the music itself. And uh, so I've, I've presented a little bit of a, um, a variety of the types of music that I, I've found on record. And maybe at that point I'll talk a little bit about uh, my experience um, finding those records, which again is not part of this talk, but initially was the thing I thought was interesting. Maybe all of you here are the same. Before eBay, you know, you had to go search for this stuff, and it was kind of fun. And when you came across something that, uh, you know, uh, exciting in a big pile of records, uh, that was that was kind of half the point of doing the whole thing. Um, so that's the last section, um, just talking about the different genres, some of the music that I've collected, and we'll play a little bit of it. And um, a lot of this music is not very listenable, both in terms of the surface noise and just uh, the music itself. If you're not uh, familiar with early Japanese music, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, I like it, but it takes, it's like, you know, strong cheese or something. It takes some getting used to. Um, so I won't, I won't uh, subject you to a big, long, uh, you know, sections of that. Okay. So, uh, just to go one step before this, um, maybe everyone's familiar with this, but uh, in about 1600, Japan closed itself off from the world, um, uh, partly due to um, Christian missionaries. Uh, Francis Xavier was in Japan at the time, the, I think, Portuguese um, Jesuit. And, uh, and I think Japan realized, actually they brought Christians in originally to, to deal with the, the Buddhists, the Buddhist monks that were kind of getting out of hand and becoming a problem for the government. And then they realized, oh, these guys might be worse. <laughs> and so, so they, they, they booted them. And uh, uh, for, oh, well, I say 300 years here, but it's really closer to 250 or 260. But uh, from, from 1600 to 1854, uh, nobody went in or out, uh, pretty much. There's a few, very, you know, very few cases of the, the, the people that managed to get in or out, but um, it was kind of on pain of death. So it was a pretty closed country for, uh, you know, between 250 and 300 years. But in 1854, um, the, uh, an American uh, gunship uh, under this Commodore uh, Perry, um, his name's Matthew Perry. Uh, I guess he's, it's the same name as that guy in Friends. So <laughs> when I Google him for a picture, that's the guy that came up. So I used this picture instead. Um, anyway, he, he forced the country open uh, just from sheer uh, military might. And, and Japan realized at that point that uh, it was behind. You know, for 250 years, it hadn't been developing the way that uh, the West had. And, and, it, and it realized uh, we need to catch up. And, and, and that's what it did. So. Um, within a few years, there were some political things that happened in the country, a, re, a sort of grabs for power in this new kind of international age. And in, in uh, 14 years after that, in 1868, this new modern era began, the Meiji era. And so the government uh, adopted um, all sorts of Western things, uh, clothing and, uh, you know, uh, 
it opened, you know, ministries of science and uh, education. And uh, parenthetically, maybe the, the Ministry of Education included um, a, a musical curriculum. So they introduced a bunch of Western music to children. Um, we'll get into it in a very few slides, but at that point, Japanese music and Western music were very different from each other. And so the Japanese people listening to Western music thought, this stuff sounds terrible, and vice versa. They both thought that. So um, it wasn't uh, adults who were, you know, introduced to, let's say, classical music and just thought this stuff is great. It was, they, they put it in the schools to, you know, starting with four-year-olds and, um, and acclimatize them to it. And so within about 30 years, people started to kind of think Western music was okay, but it, it took that long. Um, and, and um, yeah, that, that influences the development of music. It's not so much about the, the stuff that we're looking at today, but it, the, the kind of music that was recorded uh, is influenced by that. So we've got uh, traditional musics that continue to exist, and new musics that sound Western, and hybrids of those two, and just flat out copies of Western music. And that's sort of the last section of the paper is all about that sort of thing. Anyway, um, you can see from this picture, uh, what, what you can see of it, I suppose, is that the, the government, that's the emperor in, in the middle there, uh, had at that point completely adopted Western clothing to kind of bring them up to, up to speed, uh, bring them up to 1868 on the world stage was, was the idea. You know, at this point, <clears throat> Japan's a lot more comfortable with its traditions, but it, at, at that point it was sort of jettisoning, jettisoning um, Japanese clothing and, and music and literature and, and everything, just wholesale adopting the West. And it kind of splits uh, between the rich and the poor. So on the far side here, we've got a, a woodcut of um, you know uh, upper class women dressing in Western clothing, and uh, from you know virtually the same period. The picture might not actually be, but it, 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 it might as well be. In the same period, up until really World War II, um, the lower classes tended to uh, maintain traditional cultures, it says here. That means in, in clothing, in the music they listen to, and in, in everything. Uh, wet, uh, westernization was something kind of for the upper classes, and the lower classes uh, just uh, um, weren't exposed to it all that much and weren't that interested in it. Um, for uh, putting it simply, really, until after World War II. After World War II, there's uh, everybody really westernizes, but uh, until then, there's a lot of musical traditions, a lot of a lot of uh, ways of living, uh, in terms of furniture and, and and all that sort of thing, and clothing uh, that's that stays traditional with that lower class. Um, so everybody here knows this, but in 1877, we've got the Edison uh, talking machine gets invented. Um, but this, I found this interesting. In 1878, the very next year, uh, there's a some description of a, of a Ewing cylinder, I guess, uh, appearing in Japan. That's in Karata's book. So even at that time, just the, the, the very next year we see this. And that, uh, this is the first I've heard of this, but is this a, is this a familiar piece of apparatus for people, this Ewing uh, talking machine? Yeah, okay, so I'd never heard of it. Actually in Karata they call it, he calls it a Ewing, but uh, I could, reading here, it's pronounced Ewing, so, uh, you know, even that researcher who I'm depending on for a lot of things, he, he uh, had the pronunciation of the name uh, wrong. So, so that's, uh, you know, right away, we've, they've got cylinders in Japan the very next year after uh, Edison invents it. Uh, although I understand this is a different machine, um, um, but at any rate, it shows the speed that things were uh, being transferred, I guess. Um, the next thing that, that Kurata talks about is in 1889, there was a, a, a place called Rokumeikan Hall, which is where, uh, as he describes it, westernized Japanese and, and, and then Westerners also who were visiting Japan um, kind of socialized that. Uh, and the phonograph by 1889 was a, a part of that entertainment. So it became part of the uh, of the everything that happened there was the, the phonograph was uh, part of it and, and again that's the rich people uh, the, the it, it took much longer for phonographs to become uh, part of everyday life but um, at least in 1889 uh, it was already um, 
yeah, considered part of the entertainment of uh, in, a, in a place like this. Um, from there, I want to jump ahead to uh, this person, Kawakami Otojiro, and we're sort of stepping into the next uh, section here. Um, Kawakami Otojiro's troop is the, it, uh, as far as we know right now, they're the first uh, records of Japanese music that were made, was were made by this person's troop. And uh, this could be a presentation on itself. Uh, there's, a, there's books written about uh, about this troupe and, uh, and about their adventures in Europe and and uh, America, but, but for today it's it's worth bringing up because these were, uh, as far as anybody knows, and it seems to be it would be hard to imagine an earlier um, example, but th this seems to be the first Japanese music recorded. Um, so this guy Kawakami Otojiro that's pictured on this page. He was a performer, and he had a small troop of players, and they played in, it's, it's sort of like, a, I suppose it's kind of Japanese vaudeville, um, uh, the, the equivalent of vaudeville. So playing on small stages with a group of, I don't know, maybe ten people, maybe less, and putting on, uh, doing, you know, singing songs, maybe reciting poetry, putting on little pieces of plays. Uh, this was what they would do, and kind of move around the country, and there were all kinds of troops uh, like this. and. Um, uh, he's m most known in Japan for uh, this song that this uh, is titled here, uh, o, o Peke Pe. So he, he made this uh, sort of modernizing political song about the, the era, like the late 1800s in Japan. And that's what Japanese know him for. Um, and he was a little bit of a troublemaker. Um, somehow he and his troop managed to get to Europe in uh, 1899. Um, when it was still very hard for people to travel. Uh, you couldn't just leave the country if you wanted to. It was, you know, you, you had to uh, get permission. But uh, they managed to. Um, and they performed in Britain and around Europe. And at the 1900 Paris Exposition, uh, somebody asked to record them. And uh, this is... Uh, there were uh, about 30 discs made, we're not exactly sure of the number, but um, in a couple of days, uh, three or four days, they, they managed to make 30 recordings. And they might have been made by that same Frederick Geisberg, the, the, the researcher that's looked into this stuff. It says he and another person were doing recording for Berliner, and uh, maybe would have been the people who recorded uh, this. Uh, but what's What's kind of interesting, what well, what's a twist in the story is that um, this troop, uh, they were sort of jacks of all trades. They were singing a bunch of different kinds of music and, and uh, you know, serious artists in Japan, at least today, do one thing. That's all they do, one kind of music. Uh, you can't be a, can't be a theater performer and a, uh, you know, a top class uh, singer or musician or something. And, and that's what they were doing. So, um, for one thing, the level of the of the music might not be quite up to par with what was happening with the uh, you know, professionals in each uh, subgenre in Japan. Um, and for another thing, uh, uh, they were uh, well. I guess that what I what I would say about this is that for these thirty discs that were kind of recorded on the fly. Um, three years later, 600 discs that were recorded uh, with, with a lot of pre-planning were recorded in Japan by Frederick Geisberg. So these discs, uh, for a very brief period, were kind of uh, thrown out to the world and then uh, eclipsed by that, um, by the recordings done in Japan a few years later. And so, they actually disappeared until, uh, well, they were just finally re-released in 1999. Uh, in, the, in the 80s, the guy who put this project together uh, of re-releasing that music stumbled upon them in an archive with, uh, through some microfilm and uh, found that, the, the, that there had been these recordings that were three years earlier than uh, anyone had ever suspected. So they had been completely forgotten for a period of, you know, 90 years. Um, and that's also probably because they weren't released uh, in Japan. 
they were sort of relinquished. Well, the next slide I think talks about this. Well, actually, a few slides from here. So um, they were released by uh, um, the uh, Berliner catalog in uh, um, the gramophone catalog, catalog sort of in in England, and uh, they were part of a foreign music catalog, and so they were sort of novelty songs and. Uh, they will we'll see in a couple of slides. They weren't uh, very well presented, and actually the titles of the songs um, were mixed up. And so the song that you bought, thinking it was a certain title, wasn't that song at all. But it didn't really matter because whoever bought them couldn't read any of it or understand any of it anyway. So it was a bit of a mess, um, and it never made it. As far as we know, it never made it to Japan. Nobody, there's no records of anybody in Japan uh, getting a hold of this. So. Uh, they are the earliest recordings, and um, they kind of disappear from history, and it's, uh, that's a, an interesting thing. Um, the person, the uh, Kawakami Otojiro, the person who ran, uh, uh, in Japan is most famous for running that troupe, um, he's, in, in, in Europe, his wife was actually the, 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 the focus of, of attention. Um, his wife, Sada Yako, became... Uh, a kind of celebrity, in, first in Europe and then in uh, America, because of this uh, um, Japanism, this this uh, uh, sort of interest in everything Japanese that that happened in the late uh, 1800s, and uh, so we even see, you know, in in, in France they were selling a, a Sadayako kimono. Uh, so she, yeah, uh, she was the focus of things. Um, he. In Japan is most known for this one song and there's one more point I guess that I could mention to, as to why this stuff might have disappeared for so long apparently neither of them were involved in the recording uh, they weren't the musicians in the troupe they were they were the performers uh, uh, you know actors and, and maybe singers so <clears throat> on the day when those records were made it's thought that they were probably off doing something else uh, because he uh, Kawakami Otojiro was uh, a pretty good self-promoter, and he never mentioned in any of the writings that he put out that he recorded, you know, that he made records. So at least the the, the main researcher that, that's looked into this stuff thinks that it's probably because he wasn't part of it. If, if he had been, uh, it would have probably made its way into one of the many, um, you know, autobiographical works that, that uh, he put out. Uh, so this is that catalog that I mentioned. In 1901, uh, Gramophone's British foreign catalog put out these 29 records, <coughs> and uh, it doesn't matter what's, what, you can't really see what's going on on this page, but um, the, the English names and the Japanese names are all mixed up, so that was what I was mentioning earlier. And the other uh, interesting thing that, that, again, ties into the, how colorful these, these guys were, um, the celebrated Imperial Japanese Theatrical Company of the Sariako Troupe, um, they were not tied in any way to the emperor. They were not the imperial troop, but they figured, who's going to say we're not? You know, they're going off to Europe in 1900, and uh, as far as anybody else in the world knows, they're they're you know, uh, they've been asked to appear uh, by the emperor, and of course they had that's the farthest thing from the truth. They were actually kind of troublemakers in in Japan, um, but uh, that's how they appear in this in this uh, catalog. So that's that first, uh, very first instance of Japanese recording. It happens in 1900, and again, it was kind of a secret until the late 80s, and it wasn't for the general public. Nobody heard that stuff again until 1999. The uh, CD was released. But uh, we've known for um, well forever about these recordings. Um, in 1903, that same Frederick Geisberg took a trip all through. Uh, Asia, I guess, uh, several Asian countries, and he hit Japan in um, 1903 and uh, went to um, Tokyo and made his way down. Uh, we don't have a map here, but he, he started in the in the kind of eastern capital and made his way down to the western capital and then went off to uh, Taiwan. And uh, he was there for 40 days, made 600 recordings. And he recorded everything. And the recordings he made were by the top players of the time. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, these, this just kind of steamrolled that previous recording of a little troupe at the exposition in Paris. And uh, 
these recordings were released and re-released for um, you know many years. Um, eventually, of course, they went out of print. Um, there's, they're not all that listenable today. But uh, in I think 2000, um, they were re-released as an uh, 11 CD set. Not all of the recordings, but uh, a great number of them were released on 11 CDs. And uh, so we can hear what, what all of that stuff sounded like. And again, it's not very listenable, but um, I was going to run through a, a couple of them here. So we've got, we go back to this earliest music, which I'll, I'll play on the next slide, um, Gagaku, which dates to the 5th century. There are 14th century ballads. There's music from uh, the No Theater that goes back to the 12th century. Kabuki that goes back to the... Um, 15th century, I guess, songs by geisha, folk songs, uh, comedic stories like this one. Uh, let's see if I can play it. Oh. I'll just turn this up. Oh. 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 It's um, something's Anyway, um, oh, I see. It's, yeah. Well, you get the feel for it. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not too concerned about uh, hearing the whole thing. What's interesting about that? No, I won't be able to shut Oh, yep. uh, I want to go to the next one. Though. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Now that we don't have a picture either, that's. <laughs> So um, while it's getting fixed, I'll, I'll just mention that that was a comic uh, story, uh, comic storytelling. Uh, the interesting thing there is that was a British person who uh, had apparently learned pretty good Japanese and uh, was doing that for a living in Japan in uh, 1903. So sort of amazing. Um, there was lots more of uh, you know okay, well, Japanese storytellers. Did, did, is there army? Yeah. Where do you start from? Try it. I don't know if you slideshow. Bruce slideshow. Oh, there. Oh, no. Oh, I see. And you go from from, from the slide. Let's see. That. It's going to take a second. Oh, okay. So this is the only one where I have three of the slides, so it's the problematic one. Let's give it a second. It'll show up. Right. There we go. And this one. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, let's just in case that happens again, let's uh, skip the contemporary pop song. We'll listen to more of that later on. It's when I say contemporary pop song, it's uh, just music on traditional Japanese instruments, but uh, invented at the time for you know everyday audiences. Um, we'll play more of that later. So just to just to, 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 to make things move smoothly, I'll, I'll pass by that. The last one. Uh, is a Western instrumental. Well, at least it's played on Western instruments. This is the newly uh, written uh, uh, Japanese national anthem at that time, Kimi ga yo. <laughs> playing this uh, are good players uh, because they're, he was directed to them. Uh, 
that's the that's the national anthem played on on Western instrumentation, and it's from what I've heard. I don't know if it's true, but uh, it, 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 the uh, this is gagaku. This is the imperial music. Um, I heard that those players had to learn to play a Western instrument, so they may have been the same uh, players or type of players who were playing that that piece with Western instrumentation. But just to uh, outline for a second, I wanted to uh, or. I wanted to focus for a second on this gagaku music, which is the imperial music of Japan that uh, in 1903 nobody was listening to, but it was, you know, it was still a, it was sponsored and patronized by the emperor, so it was, uh, you know, strongly maintained. And so he managed to record uh, 54 pieces of that music. And uh, what did he say about it? Um, well, he point he he describes the the music. For time, I won't get into it, but um, he describes a band pretty much like this, with the zithers and a gong and a drum, a couple of drums, uh, a lute-like instrument, uh, uh, oboe-like instruments, and flutes. And uh, the group that he describes is a little bit smaller than this. It, it, it doesn't. Some of the instruments don't have two. Uh, two ver you know, there's two zithers here, and in the version he describes, there's one, likewise with the lute. Uh, so it's a slightly smaller group. Uh, anyway, he says that they played some ten pieces, and it was impossible distinct to distinguish one from the next, which is a pretty standard uh, reaction to you know, music that you're not used to. But for anyone that hasn't heard Gagaku, I thought I'd play a couple of seconds of it here. So it's, it's very ethereal. Um, it's, it's, it goes back to the 5th century, although it's been changed a lot since then, and that's sort of what it sounds like. And pretty much every song does sound like that. Uh, but you could say that about any genre. Until you get into it, every song sounds the same. That's why they are a genre, right? Um, so, uh, and I thought this was uh, uh, worth worth point. There's a, somebody's posted an article of, of uh, Geisberg's uh, journal keeping at that time. And so he writes this about uh, that experience. Uh, Japanese music is simply too horrible. Uh, which again, standard reaction at the time to, to this music that works on entirely different uh, principles. But, um, but funny to relate, Europeans who have been long in the country profess to really enjoy it and say that there is more in the music and acting than the casual observer would believe. So at least he's open to the possibility that, um, that there might be something to it, right? This <laughs> whole culture's uh, music. Um, and then he says by the end of his trip, um, I'm beginning to like the music a little. So uh, like any music, you have to, you know, you, you can't be expected to like it right off the bat. There's a couple other things I wanted to point out about um, uh, his, his journals uh, and what he said about it. Another thing, uh, over half the artists we have are blind men. Uh, the blind all seem to go in for singing and performing on musical instruments. So that was true, that, that was the case. Um, in pre-modern Japan, um, the music was, was a profession safe for the blind because it was something they could do, and so uh, it was kind of protected by the government. And so in 1903, uh, that's maybe 30 years after that edict was drawn, you know, it was rescinded and, and anybody could become a professional musician. Um, still, as he said, half of the performers who he uh, encountered were, were, were blind. So that held on for quite a while. The other thing is he talks about what he paid people. So he says fees ranged from 10 yen to 60 yen. And, you know, it's really impossible to think about what these numbers mean today. Uh, in in the, the book that I read, it says 10 yen bracket five dollars, uh, sixty yen bracket thirty dollars. It, it's hard to say what it you know. It, it's hard to make equivalencies. But um, but it, it, at that time, two yen bought a record, so you could buy it. And, and again, records were still very expensive at that point. But you could buy uh, you know a disc for two two yen, and he paid the performers between uh, ten yen and sixty yen for their performance. Uh, so that's yeah, just gives you an idea of what. Uh, they were going for there. Um, so moving on to the next section, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about record labels. Again, it's, it's something I don't know a lot about, but I'm going to sketch a very quick look at uh, the big labels and, and maybe some other labels that popped up in, 
feeling for that. So Columbia was first in. Um, in 1903, they started selling <coughs> records that were made in America, uh, but for, for sale in Japan. And uh, this is one from a book, that uh, a different book from Shirata, uh, a kind of less scholarly book that somebody's put out about 70 RPM records in Japan. And um, this is mine. It has a lower serial number, so it might be before the, it's more than likely a little bit before this one. Um, this researcher claims that it's from 1903, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, anyway, it's pressed in, um, in uh, where is it, Wisconsin or no, uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, so I don't know if that sticker is familiar to anybody, if that's a sticker that they put on or if that's just for, for Japan. Maybe it is, yeah. Um, so this is the one record that I have from that one-sided record. Terrible condition, but so it's mostly surface noise. It's a flute and a singer, and uh, and a rainstorm maybe, and that's the uh, that's all that's going on in that record. Um, so 1903, Columbia, you know, starts importing records, and in 1910 they establish Nipponophone, uh, which is a, a Japanese independent company, but kind of, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a subsidiary of Columbia, but uh, anyway, it's connected to Columbia. Um, and they start making records in Japan. Um, and then they've got a bunch of labels that are attached to them that I only found out starting to research for, for today's uh, presentation. But uh, a label called Orient that was uh, early on, uh, you know, with kind of hand printed labels, and another one called Hikoki or Airplane. Um, that I think were uh, discount records, maybe. And lastly, this Nichiku, which you can see um, has the Columbia uh, symbol up there. Uh, from what I can tell from the research I've done, it's, it was Columbia's name during the war. So uh, they, most Japanese companies during the war took on Japanese names. If they had previously had an English-sounding name, they took on a very Japanese-sounding name. And uh, that was the same, that was the case with Columbia, um, and that's what the next slide is about. Uh, this the, the, on the far side is a, is a, a war record, a song uh, meant to encourage soldiers from 1939, still on the Columbia label. The middle one is the Nichiku label, and then after the war they go back to Columbia. And so that's that's a Heartbreak Hotel, which we might get a chance to listen to later by a Japanese artist in, in 19 well 1956. Um, the next label to establish themselves is this Nito. Uh, nothing to do with Columbia, but they decided they liked that logo, so they took it. And uh, yeah, that's the that was the second, you know, record label to establish itself, and they just borrowed wholesale the Columbia two sixteenth notes. Um, and well, we won't play that, but it's a it's a it's just a violin solo, one person playing "Home Sweet Home" on violin. Uh, sort of running short on time. Next, uh, Victor Records. They start importing five years after Columbia. They start in 1908, um, and in 1927, um, they established a, a Japanese company, Victor Nippon. And as with Columbia, 1943 to 1945, they, they take on a totally Japanese name, Nihon Onkyo, which means just uh, Nihon uh, Japanese, Japan Acoustics or something like that. Um, and then just talk very briefly about a couple of other labels. This uh, red label up at the top here is Nagai Records, founded in 1925. And um, it's taken over by this company Taihei in 1931, which incorporates the Nagai uh, symbol of a, of a shell in its, in its logo. Um, in 1942, it's not taken over by King, but kind of subsumed into King for the war. And then King itself has to change its name because it's King is an English word, so it becomes uh, uh, Fuji Onkyo, you know, Fuji, Mount Fuji uh, Onkyo for the, the war, and then goes back to King. And then in 1950, Taihei becomes its own company again. And then in 1953, it's bought over by uh, Mercury and becomes Nippon Mercury Records. So that's uh, just an example of the, you know, kind of circuitous route that uh, a, a label can take. And just very quickly, some of the other big labels that we see. King Record, it's a big label for uh, still running today, started in 1930. 
1931, Teichiku, a very big label in the pre-war era, uh, sort of gone today. Uh, well, definitely gone today, but um, uh, uh, there's lots of records out there in, in flea markets and stuff by Teichiku, uh, LPs and 78 records. Um, and Taiyo, 1931, also a very short-lived label apparently. Um, all of these, well, aside from King, Teichiku and Taiyo disappear. What we find in the post-war period is that uh, these very Japanese sounding names disappear and uh, companies just take, take on more modern uh, international sounding names. Uh, and then just uh, some more quick ones. Futami in 1932, Etoile from, uh, from France in 1934, Suru in 1935. Um, that's that's just a quick rundown of some labels that I have, you know, I found multiple records uh, for uh, in searches. Now, very quickly, some stuff about players. Again, this is not my my specialty at all. So, um, I found from Kurata both of these uh, advertisements from from 1901. A graphophone, I guess that's what it seems to say on the label. And then in the Japanese text, they call it a gurahon. Because I think graphophone is just too many syllables to work into a comfortable name. Um, and then by 1910, there's a, an advertisement for a, a double-sided disc. Oops. That's <coughs> this is just a picture I found online from 1910's uh, Sankodo. Um, I don't know if that, it, well, the name might not be familiar, but the, the shape is probably familiar for the period. Uh, know about this sort of thing. And then the next two are slipped, uh, mixed up. This is maybe from the 1930s. It's from a, a record sleeve, just a, an illustration on a record sleeve that I have. So it's still wind up, but it's in a, in a box. I'm, I, I don't know, I'm just guessing the 30s. And then here's a picture from a, the 1940s, a portable player that I, I found online. Again, these are just really brief guesses at, at what was happening in Japan at the time to, to see how it syncs up with uh, what all, all of you know about. Um, and then these are also from record sleeves, um, you know, now electric uh, turntables from the, the late 50s with radios incorporated, three-speed record players with, uh, with radios, um, and then the 60s, um, again, just uh, portable record players or, or radio record players. Um, I have a found a little bit about needles um, in the I'm guessing these ones might be from the 1930s and uh, I have some prices here um, 25 sen which is like 20 like a, a quarter of a yen uh, for um, for these lower grade ones and 35 for higher grade ones and I guess that would be like two and a half cups of coffee or something I don't know if that uh, uh, that's from what I what I look, uh, read at the time, I don't know if that fits. Again, it's very hard to make those because how much was coffee at that time? Was it more expensive? And uh, you know, these sorts of things are, uh, it's impossible really to find equivalencies. I found this in one of the books that I had, and I don't know if they're imported. I, they, I assume they probably are imported, but I, I, I'd be curious to know if people have seen these uh, needle companies um, in, you know, in your own kind of wanderings through collections. And the last thing I wanted to look at uh, with, with, in terms of this, the um, records and players and all that sort of stuff, is, a, is the bamboo needle cutter. So uh, I don't know if bamboo needles were ever used in, in North America. Yeah? yeah? Okay. So I, I thought they might be, but I, I wasn't sure. So um, this is probably familiar to everyone. The, you know, you can, with these, with this sort of scissors, you can sculpt the needle that you need. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, let's skip this. This is just a quick uh, look at, at pricing and how much things cost. But again, it's, it's, it's hard. I'm, I'm guessing at equivalencies um, for in terms of the, the cost of a disc and the cost of a, of a player. Um, so we're into the last section. I know I'm kind of running out of time here. So um, just move through these. Um, I'm looking at a, a couple of different kinds of music that, um, that, that, that I've collected, and that's what I'm, I'm presenting here. So traditional musics, just flat out traditional musics that were recorded and, 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 and sold. And like I say, until World War II, 
uh, that traditional music was still pretty popular, uh, at least, uh, well, probably among everybody, but the upper classes were probably also trying to buy Western music to feel more international. Um, but, uh, and that's sort of died off now. Very, you know, the, the number of people listening to traditional Japanese music is kind of like the number of people listening to classical music in, in North America, I suppose. Um, so, I'll, I'll play very brief examples of each of these. This is a, a flute, a shakuhachi uh, performance. Probably from the early 30s. And just in the interest of time, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this stuff gets more listenable, I think. So uh, this next one is Japanese music played on Western instruments. And I've got a lot of these records. So it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, people are still interested in, in tradition, but they're updating it. And so this is, a, 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 again, probably from the 30s, a piece from the Kabuki Theater played on an accordion. Not, not very listenable, so we'll just have a couple of seconds of it. getting as close as he can to, uh, you know, he's using a diatonic or a chromatic instrument for some, you know, music that should be played on, on a, an instrument with microtones. But, um, yeah, he's, he's kind of attempting, uh, you know, uh, kabuki music on an on accordion. Um, this one is, is a lot, it's post-war, and it's, uh, it's probably early 50s, and it's, I think it's much more successful. He's playing, again, uh, a traditional folk song from the south of Japan, but it's a Hawaiian band. So that's the that's pretty much the melody, and uh, you know, oops, he does a I think he does a good job of it on the, yeah. on the slide. Can I ask uh, a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a Hawaiian Hawaiian band playing Japanese? Music? It's a Japanese Hawaiian band. A Japanese yes. Hawaiian band. Yes. So I they may have spent time in Hawaii. Uh, that's what I think. There was a bunch of them, and they're one of the famous ones. I think that's S O Hashi. Uh, well, I've got it down here somewhere. Yeah. At any rate, one of the big Hawaiian Japanese bands that played Hawaiian music who mostly just play Hawaiian, but also, you know, for fun, made Japanese songs in Hawaiian. This next group is, uh, there's a, a, from the stuff that I collected, a ton of this, hybrid music, which is um, mixing uh, Japanese and, and Western music in a very different way from the previous one, which is simply, here's a Japanese melody played on, on uh, Western instruments. This is, uh, uh, Kind of all over the place. This first one is uh, a takeoff on Tanko Bushi's very famous um, folk song from the south of Japan. Uh, it's called the Coal Mining Song of, of the South. And uh, it's probably <coughs> one of the very few songs that even young Japanese know today, a few folk songs. Um, but in uh, 1955, it was a big hit with this woman singing it in a, a kind of updated way that uh, still sounds kind of hip to my ears. Thank <laughs> you. 
one isn't so great, <laughs> but uh, but it's it's indicative of the of the kind or, or representative of the kind of music that I, I found a lot. Geisha hula. So uh, just take a word out of each hat. This is the Japanese hat, and this is the Western hat. Um, and uh, again, it's it's not. I don't think it's very successful as a piece, but um, it's uh, there's a lot of geisha something, geisha waltz, uh, geisha boogie woogie. Uh, yeah, this is a geisha hula. It's a kind of a gimmicky song, I suppose. Um, the next thing I wanted to point out was uh, just uh, flat out Western music. So Japanese bands doing Western music. This first one is a is a solo guitar uh, to St. Louis Blues. Um, uh, the the guitarist here, I think this is from the 50s. The guitarist went on to uh, he taught one of the big surf Japanese surf guitarists of the 60s, um, and and this is him just on acoustic guitar. <laughs> That's not too different from, uh, I think, any, you might hear a Westerner playing an acoustic guitar very much like that. Um, and so that was happening too. Also, I should say at this point, um, you also got uh, Western players doing St. Louis Blues. Um, uh, Rudy Valley's version of St. Louis Blues I found all over the place in, in Japan. So that must have been a big hit over there at, at some point. Um, and the second one I got just the last time I was in Japan, I, I went through a stack of uh, 78s this high, uh, two of stacks that high, and I, this is one of the records I came up with. That. It made it all worthwhile. It's a, 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 a Japanese country band singing Lovesick Blues. And it's credited to Hans Williams, which I guess is probably because the person in charge of Western music at the record label probably mostly dealt with classical music, and so he probably thought, okay, that's a mistake, S. <laughs> that's my guess, I don't know. But uh, it, here's a decent version of, of uh, Love Sick Blues. It's, it's for dancing, it's a foxtrot, and uh, probably like other records here, they give you the tempo that it's performed at, so that you can decide whether what you want to dance to at that point. Oh, cutting up. It's a tricky rhythm. <laughs> Maybe get the idea about that. That they're, you know, they're they're uh, very capable bands. And those bands, the, the the country bands at that point in the late 40s, early 50s, were playing for uh, American at the American bases. So they were getting their uh, their practicing with people who really knew the music. And they went on to be the big country bands in Japan. Um, the last two, this one, I'm not going to be able to play. I just realized today that, or yesterday when I was pasting these uh, these on here, that um, I didn't have a uh, a, a file for this one. I've got the record and I've got it on other formats, but I didn't have it on MP3 on my computer, so um, I can't get it this one. But this is a 14-year-old, uh, Eri Chiemi, who became a very big star in Japan, singing Tennessee Waltz on one side and Come On to My House on the other. And she became one of the big stars of, of uh, post-war uh, pop music. <laughs> 
Um, the other song that I do have a file for here is Heartbreak Hotel by Kosaka Kazuya and the Wagon Masters. So just like here, you know, Elvis was originally considered country, right? He was, uh, he was rockabilly, which was a sort of sub-genre of country music. And so when he went to Japan, and still to this day on these uh, uh, country music um, festivals, you'll see an Elvis impersonator still as part of the thing. But uh, early on, they just gave the Elvis songs to country bands to, to do something with. And it's not that great. Uh, Kosaka Kazuya, the, the guy who performed this, went on to be one of the big stars. Uh, on a retrospective collection they put together in the 90s, he didn't include this version of Heartbreak Hotel. Even though it's vocally, he's probably doing a much better job. He, he, record, he put on that a record that he did in the 60s with a surf guitar band who really knew the music at that point. What you'll hear here is, they're stepping all over each other. They're trying to do Heartbreak Hotel, but they're doing it with the full um, country band with slide, you know, uh, pedal steel and all that stuff. Let's see if we can hear it. Since my baby left me, for I've found a new place to dwell. For it's done at the Here, end mother. of lonely straight at Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak is so lonely, baby, cause I'm so lonely. Heartbreak is so lonely, I could die. Watch how the vocals and the instruments jump in. Kotobokuo,捨てていっちまった. Omoikitenakitai. Heartbreak hotel. Mukashi no yume o sabishiku daite. So it's not quite there. It's not quite there. The other thing is. Koi ni abure. That's maybe enough of that. The other thing about it is um, uh, the instrumentation doesn't build like the original. In, the, in Heartbreak Hotel, it's, it's a, every verse another instrument gets added, right? But in, in this one, it's just the full band. Um, but this is like four months after Elvis's version came out around the world. So they're just, they're just figuring it out, right? So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, I think I'm going to finish there. The last slide, which uh, I won't get into, is, uh, is um, something, that thing I mentioned at the beginning that, that is, might be hard to illustrate here. That uh, Here's a folk song that I learned from my teachers when I was studying uh, the music, Kushimoto Bushi, and it's played one way. And if I listen to the radio version uh, on the, you know, the, the, the national uh, radio, it's going to be that same way. And if I buy it on a CD, it's going to be the same way. But each one of these is very different from the next. And some of them are played with traditional instruments. Some of them are pop arrangements. Some of them sound like Dixieland jazz. Um, so they're, it's all the same song. But they're, they're, you know, this is what opened up my ears to the possibilities with this music in the, in the pre-war period. So that's pretty much it. The last thing was just a couple of pictures to, to show <clears throat> Along with the record, sometimes you got, uh, if it was a dance piece, sometimes you got the dance steps. And at the very least, you got lyrics. So this is, a, I mentioned there's a bunch of geisha songs. This is Geisha Waltz, which was a pretty big hit. And that in 4-4, not in uh, Waltz time. Uh, but this has uh, the lyrics all written. This is very typical for, for, for you, you buy a record, you're going to get the lyrics. But it's a little atypical in that it has the English. Uh, well, at least, not the English, but the... Uh, the Romanized uh, alphabet beside the Japanese uh, characters. So this might be um, like a souvenir. It might be the idea might be to sell it both as a souvenir and uh, and to, to the local audience. Uh, so selling, I mean, souvenir to the uh, American troops. Lastly, uh, just a couple of sleeves that I, I didn't have a chance to, to look at. But this is the sort of picture art that you sometimes got. This is a folk. Uh, for a, a, a folk music, um, and it's there's some folk crafts on this uh, on this side and on the back of map with uh, the uh, folk songs from various parts of Japan available. And this is uh, early and uh, you know early pop music and all the stars around here. And this is um, post-war pop music with the the stars of that period. Um, and the last one was I think I started with this. This is Nipponophone again. That first uh, local record company kind of set up by Columbia in 1910. And then on this side, uh, his master's voice, which I guess today, that's un owned by Sony, is that right? Uh, I think Sony bought over uh, RCA. Um, uh, so, uh, 
Uh, that's it, I guess. Yeah, that's the last slide. So I think I came in just in time, and um, oh, over time actually, ten minutes over. Sorry. <laughs> Um, all right, so thanks for, for listening, and uh, if you got any questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Any, any questions? Anybody need translation? <laughs> I'm just wondering what the music was like uh, during the uh, occupation of China and uh, the war years uh, uh -huh. uh, from, say, the 19 mid-30s until 1945. Uh, okay, so I didn't really get into this, but um, what happened, uh, a few things happened. Uh, I have some records of uh, Taiwanese music, and also there's a Korean song that became very popular. As Japan kind of expanded its empire, it started to take in that music to, as its own, to sort of say, like, this is our music now. Uh, so there's an interesting thing that happened uh, in terms of imperialism, you know. They did the same thing with ceramics, with Korean ceramics, when they uh, uh, annex Korea. It's sort of like, let's celebrate uh, our artistry, and our means Korea, you're a part of us now, right? So that's one thing that happened. But another thing is that as, as war ramped up, uh, American music became less and less uh, um, acceptable, and uh, eventually was banned. And as, the, as they got really into the 40s, like, like you know, the, the war in Japan started much earlier than 1941, but in the 40s, they, um, they started not banning, but uh, suggesting that you not play uh, entertaining music. And there was a, that, that one picture I showed you was for a form uh, genre called gunka, or war songs. So it kind of became like everything became patriotic. And so that was it. Like, you know, you can't have fun when you're listening to music. You have to kind of be thinking about the country. And there are these kind of serious songs about the suffering of the soldiers and all of that. And as, as the end of the war ramped up, it sounded like, to, to my, everything I've read, that that's what people were, listen, were forced to listen to. So when the war finished and America came in, um, and, and you know, right in 1945, within a few weeks of the end of the war, they were playing, uh, like I, they set up a base radio uh, in, in Tokyo, I guess. And they played uh, Smoke It's In Your Eyes, was the first song they played on the radio. And the Japanese uh, fell in love with Western uh, pop music post-war period. So, does that kind of get it here? Did, did they, uh, when the war broke out, did the uh, RCA and Columbia, did they completely break off ties or? They just changed their names. But so did they communicate at all with, you know? Is there I, I haven't found out, but I, I you know, my feeling is that, um, Ties were never completely broken in any of these. Like it's always about money, yeah. right? So, but yeah, I mean those names. They like specifically are uh, Columbia and Victor, uh, big the two big companies. Changed names when it became necessary. They you know called themselves something patriotic. And then as soon as the war was done, boom, back to you know, let's get rid of uh, Fuji Honkyo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how does it? JVC Japan Victor Company fit into this? Was it a descendant of Victor, or are they totally different companies? Um, that's them? something that, that I'm not familiar with. For this, I just stopped in the okay. you know sort of 50s when when records. That's what I stopped looking at stuff when 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 uh, 45s. So probably would have been say post 1950s. Oh yeah yeah uh, uh, well, like that uh, Nippon Victor actually means Japan Victor. Um, Pre-war Japan. Tended to call itself Nippon, sometimes Nihon. It's just a different pronunciation. And then uh, post-war, they often just change it to the English Japan. So uh, Japan Victor Company is really Nippon Victor from 1927. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just you know, they keep they keep updating their name to whatever suits the purposes of the time. But that's JVC, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Oh, One more, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering how far education in, in serious Western music went in Japan. I have a recording of Tamaki Miyura, an opera singer, who uh -huh. sang uh, Madame Butterfly at the Metropolitan Opera and made at least one record for Columbia Tricolor. Okay. Have you yeah. ever heard of Tamaki Miyura? I, I haven't, but there's a, there's a huge classical music scene in Japan. 
Um, this is before the first war. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the songs that I was going to play in that hybrid section mm -hmm. was a folk song sung by a, a, a Japanese person trained in opera. So she sings it in this, you know, full opera soprano voice. Mm -hmm. uh, the same song I played by the Hawaiian, uh, she does that one. Um, yeah, the, the Japanese, you know, you go anywhere in the world. Uh, people got serious about Western art music because it was the music of the, of the, of the, you know, colonial power. It was the successful power of the world. So people got serious about it. There's a lot of writing about uh, just about exactly that. Still huge in Japan, and still yeah. Japanese students, they know Western music uh, way better than Canadian yeah, students. It's got a great orchestra, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks again. Thank you very much, Gary. <laughs>